June 14th, 1969. This was a day that Bill Martin would never forget. He should have been in the midst of a fun camping trip with his sons, but instead, he found himself in the middle of every father's worst case scenario. It was the day before his son Dennis's seventh birthday, and instead of celebrating, Bill found himself bolting through the woods of the Smoky Mountains, shouting Dennis's name at the top of his lungs. The boy had vanished from their campsite, and Bill was desperate to find any sign of Dennis. He shouted and shouted, but Dennis never shouted back. That evening, the sky opened up, inflicting high winds, booming thunderclaps, and nearly three inches of rain on Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Bill Martin had no choice but to just hunker down inside an Appalachian Trail shelter, knowing full well that his son was still out there among feral hogs, dangerous snakes, and black bears. Due to all of this and the bad weather, it seemed basically impossible for Dennis Martin to survive the night. The next morning, park rangers swung into action, searching flooded trails by foot and washed out roads by Jeep. By the afternoon, almost 250 people were combing through the woods, and the next day, that number increased to 300 people and then 365. Within a week, over 1,000 people reported for duty, each one of them eager to find Dennis Martin. And as more and more people showed up, the search descended into absolute chaos. One searcher fell off a bridge, another shot himself in the leg by accident, and a group of Green Berets trudged so deep into the woods that they ran out of food and had to barbecue a rattlesnake. What started as just one desperate father searching through the woods all by himself had quickly evolved into one of the largest and messiest search operations in national park history. And yet, not one damn thing came of it. Absolutely nothing. This is the mysterious disappearance of Dennis Martin. Now, this is one of the most famous and influential cases that I've ever covered on my channel. It was a landmark case in the world of search and rescue, and it went on to provide invaluable lessons to everyone from experienced searchers all the way down to just casual day hikers. Because of this, I think it's a really important story to tell, and I'd like to thank Drink Element for making it possible for me to tell it. Now, when you're hiking, or even when you're just doing anything that involves you sweating a lot, you need to be replacing your electrolytes. Simply just drinking water is not gonna be enough, and what you should do is replace those electrolytes with Drink Element, and let me tell you why. So many electrolyte drink mixes are just full of sugar and a bunch of other nonsense you really don't want to be putting into your body, but Drink Element is not like that. It has zero sugar. Really, all that Drink Element has is a great taste and the electrolytes that you need to stay hydrated and healthy when you're hiking or doing anything else that requires sweat. And I really mean they have a great taste. They have crazy awesome flavors like citrus salt, grapefruit salt. Those are two of my favorites. And they also have these like very unique flavors like mango chili or lemon habanero, even chocolate salt. Yes, these are actual drink mix flavors that you can get from Drink Element. I think that's so creative and so cool. And after hearing me say all these flavors, you're probably like, Kyle, I wish I could just try all of them. And to that, I'll say you can. What you're gonna do is go to drinkelement.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. That's drinklmnt.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. Go and place an order for whichever flavor you think sounds best. And when you do that through my link, you're gonna get a sample pack of eight different flavors thrown in with your order for no extra cost. So you're gonna be able to get to try them all and decide which ones you like best. Once again, that's drinklmnt.com slash Kyle Hates Hiking. And thank you so much to Drink Element for supporting my channel. Now, let's get into the story. To start off, let's head to the most visited national park in the United States, that is Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Now, instead of charging you an admission fee, all I ask is that you hit that subscribe button, especially if you're a repeat viewer and you've found yourself watching a number of my videos now. That's right, I'm talking to you, thanks. 
On Father's Day weekend, 1969, the Martin family left their home in Knoxville, Tennessee, and headed to the Smoky Mountains. The group consisted of six-year-old Dennis, nine-year-old Douglas, their father Bill, and their grandfather Clyde. The trip to Great Smoky Mountains National Park was a family tradition for them, and this was actually Dennis's first time going camping. Dennis Martin was about four feet tall and weighed 55 pounds. And though he had never been camping before, he had been on day hikes in the past, and reportedly he walked so fast that the adults couldn't always keep up with him. By all accounts, he was comfortable and happy being in the woods. The Martin family started their adventure from Cades Cove Campground on Friday, and from there, they hiked up to the Appalachian Trail, which runs right along the dividing ridge between North Carolina and Tennessee. It was perfect hiking weather, and I'm sure the group was absolutely thrilled to get to their first campsite of the trip at Russell Field Shelter. They spent the night here, and then the next day they decided to take it a little bit easier, this time only hiking a few miles north on the Appalachian Trail to the next campsite, Spence Field. And when they arrived at Spence Field, they set up camp and they had no idea what was about to happen next. Nearly 50 years later, I actually did the exact same thing in the exact same spot when I through hiked the Appalachian Trail. It was now 2018 and I'll be honest, at the time, I had no idea about how infamous of a place Spence Field was. I honestly might have rethought my decision had I known about the next series of events in this story. At Spence Field, the Martins were joined by some family friends and sometime in the afternoon, the group sat down to relax. Camp was set up, lunch had been consumed, and the dishes had even been done. So there wasn't much else for the adults to do besides sit there and take in the scenery. For the young boys, however, it was playtime, and the grassy knoll that they were camped out on was the perfect spot for it. Dennis, Douglas, and two other boys that they were with hatched a devious plan to sneak up on all the adults and surprise them. But unbeknownst to the boys, the adults were onto them, and they actually watched and laughed as the group of boys split up. Douglas and the two boys went to the south, and Dennis went by himself to the north and west towards the Tennessee side of the ridge. All of the adults pretended to be surprised when the boys jumped out at them and rounds of laughter quickly followed. However, within no more than five minutes, nobody was laughing because it's at this point that they finally realized that Dennis had gone missing. Dennis was wearing a red t-shirt at the time, and it's because of this that the boys actually planned for him to sneak around on his own so that his red shirt wouldn't give them away. Bill, Dennis's father, and Clyde, Dennis's grandfather, started calling out Dennis's name, but they heard and saw nothing in return. Getting more and more desperate, they sprung into action and began searching the trails in the surrounding area. Bill Martin traveled south on the Appalachian Trail for about a mile before returning back to Spence Field, hoping that his son would be there waiting for him. When he realized that Dennis was still lost, Bill set out south once again, this time hiking the two and a half miles back to Russell Field, where they had camped that first night. But once again, he was forced to return to Spence Field without his son. And also once again, when he arrived back, Dennis was not there. While Bill was desperately searching along the Appalachian Trail, Clyde made his way off the ridge. He hiked over eight miles back down to Cades Cove campground, and when he arrived, he reached a ranger station. He reported Dennis Martin missing at roughly 8.30 p.m. that night, the day before the boy's seventh birthday. This marked the start of a search effort, which would turn into more and more of a cluster with each passing day. Excuse my harsh language there, but I think you're gonna realize what I mean in just a second. 
That first night that Dennis was reported missing, the search was quite limited. In addition to the searching that Bill and Clyde had done, Rangers interviewed hikers at Spence Field who had traveled in from various directions and trails. None of these hikers interviewed had noticed anything out of the ordinary, let alone actually seen Dennis. And then that night, a massive storm rolled through the Smoky Mountains, dumping down almost three inches of rain in just the span of a few hours. This was extremely unlucky for the search, obviously, but it's also not exactly uncommon. I mean, they are called the Smoky Mountains after all, they're known for volatile weather, and they're actually technically a rainforest. But regardless of what's expected or not expected, these thunderstorms were bad news for the search. Not only did the weather slow down the search right when it was at its most critical point, I mean, the boy had only disappeared a few hours earlier, but after it passed, it left Spence Field and the surrounding area, the entire Great Smoky Mountains National Park, mind you, a muddy, flooded mess. This would hinder the pace of searching the next morning, and it would also potentially cover up important clues and evidence about where Dennis Martin could have ended up. And also, let's just be frank here, it could have killed the boy. Without shelter, he could have easily became hypothermic or been swept away in a flash flood. I mean, it's just, it's just not a good situation. Searchers knew this could have been the case, but regardless, they ramped up their efforts the next day. By the afternoon, there was 240 people in the park searching for Dennis. His mother had also arrived at this point after learning at church that her boy was missing, by the way, super sad. And from there, the number of searchers started to balloon at an absolutely ridiculous rate. Within a week, 1,400 people, some official searchers, many just volunteers, descended upon the Smoky Mountains, all of them eager to find the missing boy. Groups ranging from the Boy Scouts all the way up to the Green Berets showed up. Helicopters, dogs, and even loudspeakers were used, blasting the boy's name, trying to find any sign of him. President Nixon himself even contacted park officials, telling them that he would be following the search. And one might think that there's strength in numbers in a situation like this, but it's actually at this point that the search really started to just fall apart. The magnitude of this search effort had never been seen before and organizing it was all but impossible. Some volunteers reportedly didn't even know how to use a compass or other important searching tools. At one point, a volunteer actually fell off a bridge and broke his arm, requiring medical attention. And then another searcher accidentally shot himself in the leg requiring even more intense medical attention. And those green berets that I mentioned, well, they would end up hiking themselves so deep into the woods that they ran out of food and had to kill and barbecue a rattlesnake in order to sustain themselves. I'm gonna quote from retired park ranger Dwight McCarter, who was involved in the search from the morning after Dennis went missing. He said, all of those people that's a lot of footprints, all those trucks. We searched and searched. Something should have been found, but you have to know what to look for. Get just a few of us trackers in first and give us a chance. Clearly, he and lots of other people were worried that such a large number of people, especially people who weren't really trained in searching, were just going to be trampling over evidence, missing things. I mean, it was just an absolute disaster. But with that said, the obvious reason that so many people volunteered is because, well, it's a seven-year-old boy after all. It's a case that really just tugs at people's heartstrings. And so while I am obviously criticizing the search efforts, I do just want to take a moment to acknowledge the heart and determination that all of the searchers displayed, even if at the end of the day, it might have kind of been, yeah, a total disaster. Despite over a thousand people searching and all the efforts, Dennis Martin was never located and hardly any evidence was ever found. It basically just seemed like he up and vanished, as though the Smoky Mountains had simply swallowed him whole. However, 
There was one potential clue discovered on day four of the search. Now this clue didn't end up leading searchers to Dennis, but it did give us a glimpse into what might have happened to the missing boy. In the vicinity of Eagle Creek, which was roughly a mile away from where Dennis Martin was last seen, by the way, some hikers discovered suspicious looking footprints leading off of a trail. Intrigued, they followed the footprints as far as they could, some 300 yards before finally losing them at the edge of one of the many flooded streams in the area. Now, on first thought, these footprints could have belonged to anybody, right? Well, a closer examination provided evidence that the footprints might have actually belonged to Dennis. First of all, one of the prints was from a bare foot and the other print was from a shoe. This would be consistent with a lost, desperate boy roaming around in the woods. Second of all, the prints were found at a confusing junction with a water break, which looks very much like a trail and could easily confuse a child into following it. And lastly, both prints were small. You could even describe them as child-sized. A cast was made of the prints, but the Martin family felt as though the prints were too big for Dennis's feet. And it didn't take long for an explanation about these prints to emerge. The tracks were supposedly left by Boy Scouts, which would explain the small feet size. And besides, the Green Berets confirmed that they had already searched this area and they insisted that they would have found Dennis if he was nearby. But Still, it's kind of hard to look back today and completely discount this evidence like they did at the time. I mean, first of all, the footprints were that of one single child, not an entire Boy Scout troop. So that explanation really doesn't make sense. And also, there's no way that the Boy Scouts would have been searching without shoes on through this tough terrain. And so unfortunately, the only clue that resulted from this massive search was never properly followed up on and we'll really never know how much validity it had. There were a few more clues into the disappearance of Dennis Martin, but these clues all came in after the official search had already been suspended. More than a month after the disappearance, a man came forward and claimed that while visiting Cades Cove on Father's Day weekend, the same weekend that Dennis disappeared, he witnessed something suspicious. The man claimed that he was hiking off trail and was quoted saying, when we got about half a mile or maybe three quarters of a mile from the car, we heard a scream a troubling scream, an enormous, sickening scream. We couldn't tell which direction it came from, but it sounded like it came from higher on the mountain to me. I looked across the creek and saw a man in the bushes. I couldn't tell much about him because he was going down the creek towards the cars. He was definitely trying to keep from being seen. I thought maybe he was a moonshiner. And then this man that I was quoting allegedly found a homemade map located right where this creepy man that he had seen was standing. And he also noticed that this creepy man had likely driven off in an older model white Chevrolet. And so this story certainly sounded promising, but after investigating, officials ended up concluding that it was unrelated to Dennis Martin's disappearance. They believed that the man's location at the time was too far away from Spence Field for Dennis to have traveled there in the timeline presented. And thus, the second real lead in the case hit a dead end, and it would be years before the next lead would present itself. 16 years to be exact. In 1985, a man came forward and reported that he had discovered the remains of a small child in the area of Big Hollow near Tremont, Tennessee, deep inside the national park. This discovery was supposedly made some three to four miles straight line from where Dennis Martin was last seen. The area was searched by up to 30 men, but 
nothing was ever found. The man who made this report said that he had actually found the body a number of years earlier, but he neglected to tell officials because he was illegally hunting ginseng at the time. So he was afraid that he would end up getting arrested for that if he reported this thing that was completely unrelated. It's really, really frustrating. And thus, this lead would also prove to be a dead end and the last major lead that I'm aware of. Despite the biggest search in Great Smoky Mountains National Park's history, which still holds true to this day, by the way, one of the biggest searches in National Park history, period, 54 years have passed, 54, and we still don't know what happened to Dennis Martin. It's reported that some family members believe he was kidnapped, and this would certainly line up with the story about the suspicious man in the woods, but the fact is, zero evidence of this exists. Hell, we don't even have a suspect's name. Now, it's also possible that Dennis was the unfortunate victim of one of the thousands of black bears in the Smoky Mountains, or maybe he was bitten by a rattlesnake, or a copperhead, or a cottonmouth, or in the most likely scenario, Dennis just got lost in the woods and couldn't find his way back due to the storm that night and just ended up dying due to exposure. This is the theory that lead investigators believe to be the most likely, but in my opinion, we're probably never gonna know exactly what happened. We do know, however, that a search will never be handled in the same unorganized manner ever again. The search for Dennis Martin has been analyzed and critiqued for decades, and it actually serves as a case study on what not to do. The National Park Service completely revamped its search and rescue plans after this, and never again will such a large influx of untrained and unorganized volunteers be allowed to just trample through an active search zone. The search for Dennis Martin cost $70,000 at the time, over half a million dollars in today's money, and Bill Martin, Dennis's father, died in 2014 without any closure on his son's disappearance. Today, Spence Field has been taken over by tree growth and it hardly resembles a field anymore. It hardly resembles the site that was once the location for one of the most mysterious disappearances in National Park history. My heart goes out to Dennis Martin, Bill Martin, and the rest of the Martin family. And though this case is sad, the silver lining is that it directly resulted in improved search procedures throughout the world and has likely saved many, many lives. I wanted to leave you with that positive perspective at the end of this video. Thank you for watching, everybody.